that's the only sort of weirdness that I uh, can already put out for today. Um, so again, uh, here we are at the Humanities Institute, uh, which is uh, MLG's uh, unofficial home. It's kind of like Wrigley Field, it's a dump, but it's our dump. Um, and um, without further ado, I'll just let the first panel begin. Um, I'm Chris Kuchar and I'm going to be moderating the panel. Let me just introduce the topic of the panel um, and the speakers. Um, the order of the speakers is Spencer Pam. Okay. So it's Spencer Leonard, um, Pamela Nogales, and Jeremy Cohen um, will be presenting. And uh, the title of the panel is uh, Marxism and the Bourgeois Revolution. Um, and this is our description of the, of the panel. Uh, the bourgeois revolutions from the 16th through the 19th centuries, extending into the 20th century, conformed humanity to modern city life, ending traditional pastoral religious custom in favor of social relations of the exchange of labor. Abbe Sayez wrote in 1789 that in contradistinction to the clerical first estate who prayed and the aristocratic second estate who fought, the commoner third estate worked. He said, what has the third estate been? Nothing. What is it? Everything. Kant warned that universal bourgeois society would be the mere midpoint in humanity's achievement of freedom. After the last bourgeois revolutions in Europe of 1848 failed, Marx wrote of the constitution of capital, the ambivalent, indeed self-contradictory character of free wage labor, in the late 20th century, the majority of humanity finally abandoned agriculture in favor of urban life, however, in slum cities. How does the bourgeois revolution appear from a Marxian point of view? How did what Marx called the proletarianiz proletarianization of society circa 1848 signal not only the crisis and potential supersession, but also the need to fulfill and complete the bourgeois revolution? whose task now fell to the politics of proletarian socialism, expressed by the workers' call for social democracy. How did this express the attempt, as Lenin put it, to overcome bourgeois society on the basis of capitalism itself? How did subsequent Marxism, however, lose sight of Marx on this? And how might Marx's perspective on the crisis of the bourgeois revolution in the 19th century still resonate today? Spencer. So, uh, my title is Marxist Critique of Political Economy, Proletarian Socialism, Continuing the Bourgeois Revolution, question mark. If, as Chris maintains in a recent issue of the Platypus Review, the fates of, I should say that all of us are members of the Platypus Affiliate Society, if, as Chris maintains in our publication, The Platypus Review, the fates of liberalism and socialism have been indissolubly tied since 1848, even if their connection has been extremely fraught. And if, as he also maintains, <coughs> Marxism was the attempt to transcend the antinomy inherited from the bourgeois revolution of individual and collective freedom, of liberalism and socialism, then the first question that must be addressed is not the statement's accuracy or validity, but its obscurity. For to raise the question of Marxism's relationship to liberalism necessarily draws attention to the potential for regression endemic to capitalist modernity and the ubiquity of this regression in our own time. To displace that issue, contemporary Marxism regards itself as hostile to liberalism, as if either could be said to exist. Marxists are bourgeois revolutionaries. Though no classical bourgeois thinker like Rousseau, Diderot, Kant, and Hegel, whom he so greatly admired, nor a vulgar bourgeois like the post-1848 liberals John Stuart Mill and Frederick Bastiat, Marx himself was nonetheless a bourgeois intellectual. Nor do I mean this in a merely sociological sense. Like the European socialists Fourier, Wilfred Owen, Saint-Simon, the left Ricardians such as Thomas Hodgkin and uh, Jean-Joseph Proudhon, Marx was a thinker, albeit a critical one, of industrial socialism. Even more emphatically than they, Marx's was the thought of the mature form of capitalism, the constitution of which was the task of the bourgeois revolution and bourgeois revolutionaries. <coughs> 
in its highest expression, that of Proudhon, pre-Marxian socialism expressed a sort of absolute bourgeois consciousness, characterized by a synthesis of the great streams of British political economy, German idealist philosophy, and French revolutionary politics. In attempting to grapple with this socialist consciousness that combined within itself all streams of freedom thinking, Marx undertook not to oppose his own categories and concepts to socialism, or to the classical thinkers to whom Proudhon and the other socialists were indebted, but to grasp socialist thought critically as the consciousness of a transitional social form. He undertook this in order to facilitate the working through and realization of socialism's intrinsic contradictions, and thus to complete the revolution first begun by humanity's emancipation from traditional society. As Marx and Engels were clear in their own minds about their imminence to bourgeois revolutionary thought, Marx and Engels were clear in their own minds about their imminence to bourgeois revolutionary thought, for as they saw even prior to 1848, with the French Revolution, the fraught and seemingly intractable question of liberalism's relationship to socialism had become the true object of philosophy. As Engels wrote after an international gathering of radicals in London, organized by the Chartists, when English people, French people, and those Germans who take part in the practical movement but are not theoreticians, nowadays talk about democracy, theoreticians here is being used contemptuously, uh, about democracy and the fraternization of nations, this should not be understood simply in a political sense. Already, from 1789 onwards, the battle cry of the revolutionary armies was guerre au palais, paix aux chaumières, war to the palaces, peace to the cottages, du pain, du fer et du cour, bread, arms, and courage. These and a hundred other obvious details already prove how greatly democracy differed at that time from a mere political organization. To this gathering, it will be clear that the Constitution of 1793 and the terror originated with the party that derived its support from the insurgent proletariat and that Robespierre's overthrow signified the victory of the bourgeoisie. The French Revolution was a social movement from beginning to end, and after it, a purely political democracy became a complete absurdity. The whole European social movement today is the second act of the revolution. The preparation for the denouement of the drama which began in Paris in 1789 and now has the whole of Europe for its stage. It is, it is time in our cowardly, selfish, beggarly epoch to remember Marat and Denton, Saint Just and, bon and Babouf. If that mighty epoch, those mighty character, those iron characters, do not still tower over our mercenary world, then humanity must indeed despair. Unquote. In the following years, in the years following 1848's failure to work out the final consequences of the democracy of 1793. Marx renewed his project of the imminent critique of bourgeois society, begun with his direct critique of the radicalism of his day, articulated in works like the German ideology and especially the poverty of philosophy and the Communist Manifesto. Marx's post-1848 writing took the form of the critique of political economy, understood not simply as economics, but as the as bourgeois society's attempt to recognize itself as the intellectual site within which the bourgeois revolution that arrived in 19th century socialism could most distinctly be grasped and critically appropriated. That is, for Marx, political economy was from its first clarification of the stakes of the English civil wars to the left Ricardian theorization of the rise of labor politics, a struggle for philosophy, for self-consciousness of the age. As Marx remarked in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, as unheroic as bourgeois society is, it nonetheless took heroism, sacrifice, terror, civil war, and battles of entire peoples to bring it into being. Nor was that struggle wholly without revolutionary theory. To the extent that it had brought the new into being, this had been achieved consciously. The critical appropriation of political economy is thus Marx's claim to inherit the bourgeois struggles the bourgeois struggle for consciousness in the changed circumstances that that struggle had itself brought about. The tradition that weighed like a nightmare upon the brains of those living in 1848 was precisely that of the old revolution. <laughs>
Marx is no more an economist than were the political than the classical political economists themselves, whose work he completed and rendered scientific. This fact alone is obscure to Marxists today. Philosophically naive, if not vulgar themselves, Marxists believe Marx to have criticized Smith as a liberal utopian committed to a th theology of perfectly functioning markets in the hidden hand, David Harvey. Or even more vulgarly, as an intellectual defender of bourgeois class interests, Alex Kalinikos. What eludes Marxists today is that in an important sense, Marx has no criticism of the classical political economic tradition. Rather, Marx critiques political economy in order to live up and live up to it and realize it through its own self-overcoming. That he does this, moreover, is not without precedent in, for instance, Adam Smith's criticism of the mercantilists or Ricardo's criticisms of Smith. This is not to diminish Marx's achievement or to occlude the distinction between political economy and its critique, but to emphasize what in the long death agony of Marxism few Marxists fully appreciate namely Marxism's imminence to liberalism. I will illustrate this in the time that remains by reference to Marx's relationship to and reading of Adam Smith. By the mid-18th century, the revolution pressed for by the great 17th century political economists had both borne fruit and reached a crisis. This was the moment when Adam Smith made his key contribution to the self-apprehension of capital by his recognition that labor alone is the ultimate and real standard by which the value of all commodities can, at all times and places, be estimated and compared. As Marx for Marx, it was an immense step forward for Adam Smith to throw out every limiting spe specification of wealth-creating activity, not only manufacturing or commercial or agricultural labor, but one as well as the others, labor in general. With the abstract universality of wealth-creating activity, we now have the universality of the object defined as wealth, the product as such, or again, labor as such, but labor as past objectified labor. The self-consciousness of the bourgeois revolution in crisis, Smith cr grasped what was essential about the social transformations through which he was living, as he lived in a time when the generalization of wage labor was in prospect. Quote, indifference towards any specific kind of labor presupposes a developed totality of real kinds of labor, of which no single one is any longer predominant. Smith's abstraction of labor as such is not merely the mental product of a concrete totality of labors. Indifference towards specific labors corresponds to a form of society in which individuals can with ease transfer from one labor to another, and where the specific kind is a matter of chance or indifference for them, hints of indifference. Of, of, is, is a matter of chance for them, hence of indifference. Not only the category labor, but labor in reality has here become the means of creating wealth in general and ceased to be organically linked with particular individuals in any specific form. Though his work in a crucial sense is pre-industrial, Smith not only described, but pushed for the generalization of wage labor, thereby the necessity of the Industrial Revolution. Building upon while relaying the foundations of the legacy of political economy, Smith grasped the necessity of consciously advancing the value form as a product of human emancipation. As Marx remarks, the classics of political economy, Adam Smith and Ricardo, represent a bourgeoisie which, while still struggling with the relics of feudal society, works only to purge purge economic relations of feudal taints, to increase the productive forces, and to give a new upsurge to industry and commerce. The proletariat that takes part in this struggle and is absorbed in this feverish labor experiences only passing accidental sufferings and itself regards them as such. Economists like Smith and Ricardo, who are the historians of their epoch, have no other mission than that of showing how wealth is acquired in bourgeois productive relations, of formulating these relations into categories, into laws and of showing how superior these laws, these categories are for the production of wealth to the laws and categories of feudalism. Locked in Burkean or Badovian recoil from the capital revolution, the left today is oblivious to what Marx and Engels grasped fundamentally, that classical political economies demand for the realization of bourgeois society gave conscious expression to the revolutionary aspirations of laboring mankind. In Smith's day, capitalism propelled enlightenment, and vice versa. And it is on this account that, contra the neoliberalisms, the neoliberals, or the, I should say the new liberals, such as Jonathan Israel and other would-be defenders of an enlightenment whose genuine radicalism utterly eludes them and would terrify them into reaction if they could recognize it, 
Adam Smith is to be reckon, reckoned among the most radical of 18th century philosophes. Rather than simply recycling the philosophical atheism of the 17th century, Smith imported English political economy into Scotland to comprehend in thought the tasks of the world revolution in his own day. His demand for the generalization of private property and the independence of men as owners of themselves was no less revolutionary than, than, than Proudhon's demand for the abolition of private property generations later. The point typically evaded by Marxists in their misapprehension of the later Marx's writings as somehow economic is this. As the working class, through its political self-constitution, became owners of their labor power and thus bourgeois subjects, political economy came to express the consciousness and the limitations of the consciousness of the socialist workers movement itself. The working class, not John Stuart Mill and other vulgar economists, are the true heirs of Smith and Ricardo. For like the bourgeois political economists, the working class was faced, was forced to do what they had done, namely to struggle the, to grasp the historical totality. Though un unlike bourgeois political economy, they had to do so in practical self-consciousness. As Marx wrote in the 18th Brumaire, bourgeois revolutions like those of the 18th century storm more swiftly from success to ex success. Their dramatic efforts, their dramatic effects outdo each other. Men and things seem set in sparkling diamonds. Ecstasy is the order of the day, but bourgeois revolutions are short-lived. Proletarian, re proletarian revolutions, by contrast, constantly criticize themselves, constantly interrupt themselves in their own course, return to the apparently accomplished in order to begin anew. They deride with cruel thoroughness the half measures, weaknesses, and paltrinesses of their first attempts, seem to throw down their opponents only so the latter may draw new strength from the earth and rise before them again, more gigantic than ever, recoil constantly from the indefinite colossalness of their own goals until finally a situation is created which makes all turning back impossible. When the working class demanded the 10-hour day, it demanded, the fullest realize, it demanded a fuller realization of the commodity form as it was realized in per industrial production. When it threw its opponent to the ground, it rose up on a colossal scale, challenging the working class to grapple with the colossal character of its own emancipatory project. In Marx's famous remark in the Grundrisse upon the method of political economy, he locates Smith within the history of the conceptual evolution of the dialectical science of society. In its earliest phase, political economy struggled to wrest free from the immediacy of social, of social practice. It began with the population, a chaotic conception of the whole, and by a process of abstraction, moved analytically towards ever simpler concepts, from the imagined concrete towards ever more attenuated abstractions, until it arrived at the simplest determinations. Here is the process that the likes of William Petty Bois Guibert, North, Barbon, and Locke undertook in the last third of the 17th century as a result of which bourgeois social, legal, and institutional forms were unmistakably put in place for the first time. In that heroic period of the science of capitalism, thinkers began with the living whole, with population, nation, state, several states, etc., and concluded by discovering through analysis a small number of determinations, abstract general relations, such as division of labor, money, value, etc. Already by the 17th century, what Marx wrote in 1843 to his erstwhile friend and comrade Arnold Rouge was coming to be, namely, in and through its coming into being, post-feudal society formed the philosophical object. With the rise of capitalism, philosophy became worldly. And by the second half of the 18th century, the capital revolution had unmistakably stalled in oligarchy and state-sponsored monopolies, eliciting from Adam Smith a political economic system which, quote, ascends from the simplest relations such as labor, division of labor, need, exchange value the level, to the level of the state, exchange between nations and the world market. As Marx remarks, that was obviously the scientifically correct method. By developing abstractions that rise from the abstract to the concrete, Smith's thought appropriates the concrete, both more fully and self-consciously. Commenting on bourgeois political economy, Karl Korsch wrote, the material relations of production of the capitalist epoch only are what they are in combination with the forms in which they are reflected in the pre-scientific and bourgeois scientific consciousness of the period. <laughs> 
and they could not subsist in reality without these forms of consciousness. The material, I'm going to reread that. The material relations of production of the capitalist epoch are what they are in combination with the forms in which they are reflected in consciousness and could not subsist in reality without those forms of consciousness. Were not capitalist society philosophical in this sense? Were there no such coincidence of consciousness and reality in the great works of bourgeois political economy, there would, in fact, as Korsh notes, be no way in which a critique of political economy could function as a theory of social revolution. Smith's thought was critically bound up with his society in a double sense. It was of that society even as it advanced it. If, Nicholas, if as Nicholas Brown commented at this year's Platypus Convention, Marx is more Hegel, Hegelian than Hegel, I would only add that this is most crucially true precisely with reference to Hegel's idealism, which is nowhere better anticipated than in the wealth of nations and nowhere more fully realized than in Marx's so-called economics, that this same capitalist society later failed to realize and overcome itself is alone what renders Smith ideological just as surely as it falsifies Marxism itself. Smith addressed himself to the competing schools of political economy as a philosopher of freedom, grasping what he called commercial society in order to renew the revolution formed, and, and, or, and grasping what he called commercial society in order to re renew the revolution formed his leading preoccupation. As political economy's historical consciousness, this is as the historical consciousness, that is as the historical consciousness of the bourgeois revolution, Marx's critique flows out of Smith. It's neither assimilable to nor extricable from political economy as the bourgeois philosophy par excellence. Just as Smith presupposed and sought to advance the 17th century revolution, Marx presupposed Smith and the French Revolution. And for Marx, rendering conscious capital's transitional character required achieving a deeper sense of historical specificity, a deeper grasp of the freedom problem that the laboring classes had set themselves in and through their own project of self-emancipation. It is this critical project of realizing capital, initiated by the bourgeois revolution and taken up by Marx, that's been lost sight of today. Like the vulgar thinkers of the post-1848 bourgeoisie, today's left fails to, beyond, to advance beyond their predecessors and regresses behind their level. And just as the vulgar political economists elicited from Marx's pen no more than a torrent of vitriol, today's left is beneath critique. This paper is titled Marx on the American Civil War. It will deal with Marx's writings in the American Civil War. The threat of historical regression figures prominently in Marx's writing on the American Civil War and plays a central role in his conception of an international left. I hope to clarify why it is critical that students of Marxism today recognize that support for the North by the International Working Men's Association and Marx's writings in the American Civil War as the further clarification of the self-conscious historical role of an independent workers' movement on the world stage as it was being formed in the aftermath of 1848. One of the least remarked upon aspects of Marx's writings is that his concern, it's his concern with the possibility that the slave South, if victorious, could define the future of U.S. capital relations on the basis of slave labor. In retrospect, that Marx even considered as a potential outcome of the war the, quote, reorganization of the Union on the basis of slavery under the recognized control of the slaveholding oligarchy, end quote, may sound outrageous. Certainly the North held a surmounting advantage in several respects. History, it seems, was on its side. Significantly, however, the results of the historical conflict were far from fixed for Marx in the period leading up to 1862. 1862 was a turning point for several reasons, the most significant of which is the inclusion of blacks in the Union Army, signaling the coming inclusion of black regiments. Marx's contemplation of a potential Southern victory was not based on the military force of the South, or the shrewdness of its politicians, but rather on the possibility that the South could, because of its role as the keeper of slave labor and its relationship to the reconstitution of capital in England, and thus globally, manage to gain diplomatic legitimacy on the world stage. Significant gains in the battlefield, along with bribery and diplomacy, end quote, Marx argued, 
could have attracted international support for the South and help, quote, secure recognition of the independence of all slave states, end quote. Even in his writing after 1862, he returns to the image of a 19th century United States restructured on the basis of slave labor. In the 1865 International Working Men's Association, the address to President Lincoln on the occasion of his re-election marks his formulation of historical regression resurfaces. Here's a lengthier quote. When an oligarchy of 300,000 slave, 300, slaveholders dare to inscribe for the first time in the annals of history the, sla the word slavery on the banner of the armed revolt, maintain slavery to be a beneficent institution, indeed the old institution of the great, the old solution to the great problem of the relation of capital to labor, and cynically proclaimed property in man as the cornerstone of a new edifice, then the working classes of Europe understood at once that the slaveholders' rebellion was to sound a toxin for a general holy crusade of property against labor, and that for the free men of labor, with their hopes for the future, even their past conquests were at stake in that tremendous conflict on the other side of the Atlantic. For Marx, the Working Men's League's political orientation, sorry, the Working Men's Association political orientation against the American South was founded on the recognition that the Southern solution of the contradiction between capital and labor was a regressive reaction to bourgeois social relations. Marx's often quoted remark that labor in the white skin cannot be free so long as labor in the black skin is branded should be read in this light. The key word there is branded, that is, laboring activity while remaining bound within slave labor cannot be treated as an object by the worker, in this case by the slave, insofar as the very life of the slave can be reduced to laboring property. The free wage laborer is not identical to her social position. She enters into a contractual relationship and reconstitutes herself through selling her labor power on the market. She's the owner of her labor power, and, which is a granted bourgeois right, that is the right to work. The worker can then make demands and choose to withhold her labor. In a society in which slave labor and free labor were both available, the ability to politically organize a working class is undermined by the presence of a permanent laboring force. In the 19th century, Southern planters argued for the need to reinstate a traditional order of society cleansed from the unpatriotic profiteering of the manufacturing North. Their disenchantment with bourgeois social relations ran deep. Southern planters were particularly suspicious of a democracy, a vulgar despotism of mere numbers, which they held as a completely bankrupt practice. Some even going so far as to say that the establishment of hereditary aristocracy by reinstituting primogeniture and entail would check the democratic tendencies of the age. By defending the gains of bourgeois revolutions, mainly the aspiration that freedom should be granted to all, I would argue that Marx clearly took the ideology of the planter class as a serious threat and recognized the spread of slavery as an affront to the principles of egalité and liberté. The planter class, Marx wrote, quote, loudly proclaimed the principle that only certain races are capable of freedom, that is, that some would have to be enslaved so that others could be free. In other words, the slave South was not pre-bourgeois, but deeply anti-bourgeois. In the 19th century, Marx relentlessly attacked in several instances the canard that the Civil War had little to do with slavery and was, rather, provoked by the implementation of tariffs by northern congressmen. He rejected altogether the specious claim that this was really a war of free trade against protectionism. It's telling, Marx points out, that the secessionist Congress at Montgomery stays mum on the protectionist policies favoring Louisiana's sugar cultivation. So does the London Times. Marx calls out the London press for its music acrobatics in order to save face. He notes that they printed articles both against the northern enemies of trade and to retain their anti-slavery credibility against the slave drivers of the South. Quote, they continually write two articles, one article in which they attack the North and another article in which they excuse their attacks on the South. Qui s'excuse, s'accuse. The American Civil War, Marx wrote, is a war of extension and perpetuation of slavery. The South's preemptive measures against the North are indirect response to the rise of the Republican Party against what Democrats had, suspect, had suspected would bring the end of Southern slavery, which by its very nature, argues Marx, compels the planter class to seek out new land for commercial and agriculture, for commercial agricultural production. This migratory or expansionist tendency of slave labor is key to Marx's understanding of the conflict. <clears throat> 
At the outset of the Civil War, only about one quarter of the white population were slave owners, 7% of which owned nearly three quarters of the black slaves. This potent minority, the slave oligarchy, made up the political power of the slave South. The interest of the planter class permeated throughout all Southern institutions. Banks in the American South guaranteed that capital would be used toward the movement of staple crops and purchase of land and slaves, and little else. Banks were closely supervised by the planter-dominated state legislator. They were intimately tied to the planter class and often found it necessary to add prominent planters to their board of directors. Contrary to northern economic directives, manufacturers in the South were taxed in order to support plantation efforts, thus prohibiting any substantial growth of southern industry. And so it was in this way that the economic interests of the planter class ruled the South. Mobilization in the South for secession intensified in 1860, once the election of a Republican president became imminent. For the secession is the election of the president of President Abe Lincoln, the black Republican, was sufficient cause for the destruction of the Union. The infamous governor of South Carolina, Francis Wilkinson Pickens, declared that as long as the government is on our side, I am sustaining it. If our opponents seize the government, I am for war. Southerners reacted to what they saw as a threat to the Southern planter oligarchy. Um, sorry, uh, right, as a threat. So Republican ideology, the call for free speech, free soil, free labor, free men, was imminently bound up with the extension of bourgeois social relations. And Republicans conceived of the successful implementation of free labor throughout the North and the West as key to the growth of the country. They thought that by isolating the South, slavery would eventually meet its demise. The conflict between the free labor ideology of the South and of the North had been brewing for quite some time before the Civil War. Office holders recognized that the admission of a slave state or a free one would break the delicate balance. And so to prevent conflict, territorial compromises became an indispensable part of party unity in the 19th century. The American Civil War sliced right through the legacy of compromise with the slave South, what the boys had called the cheap bargaining with human freedom throughout the history of the United States, and what Marx characterized as the original sin in the founding of the United States. And it is through this framework, I think, that the formulation by historians Charles and Mary Beard of the Civil War as the second American Revolution allows for critical reflection of the bourgeois character of the American Civil War. The Republican Party understood that it had to defend its vision of freedom. It understood that it had to control its own destiny or perish. And I think that Marx would add, so did the South. For Marx, the critical support of the Republican North against the pro-slavery South was important in two respects. The first, that the Republican Party was capable of challenging the political power of Southern slave oligarchy and would stop the spread and potentially once and for all lead to the abolition of the institution of slavery in the United States and thus eradicate it as a viable alternative to free labor. And second, that critical support of the North provided the opportunity for the self-clarification of the historical role of an independent movement of the working class on a global stage. Marx's criticism of the Lincoln administration and their hesitation over arming black troops fears clearly grounded on the effects of the total abolition of slavery and the call by Marx to go beyond the conservative limitations of the constitutional waging of war are key in this respect. The cotton crisis brought on by the American Civil War had devastating effects on the British working class. The scarcity of cotton resulted in unemployment or at best part-time work for a large section of the proletariat Contrary to the necessities of their immediate welfare, the organized working class of England, as Marx reports, put forth an explicitly anti-slavery position alongside a critique of the government's flirtations with the secessionist South. Unlike the English proletariat on the eve of the Civil War, the American working class had declared itself for the preservation of the Union and called for the prevention of the war against the South. As the Civil War developed, workers in New England would eventually support the abolition of slavery and populated the Union Army in the war against the South. The shift in political orientation was brought about by their engagement with the conflict and also, and importantly so, by the political leadership provided by the organization of the English working class. In, 1863, in an 1863 letter to Engels, Marx wrote, the Times and company are utterly furious over the workers' meetings in Manchester, Sheffield, and London. It is very good that the eyes of the Yankees are opened in this way. For the rest, Updike, then the mayor of New York and a political economist, 
Updike has already said at the meeting in New York, we know that the English working class are with us and that the governing classes of England are against us. I greatly regret, this is Mark speaking, I greatly regret that Germany does not hold similar demonstrations. They cost nothing and internationally bring in large returns. Germany would have had all, more war, all the more warrant for these, as in this war she has done more for the Yankees than France in the 18th century. It is the old German stupidity of not making herself felt in the world theater and stressing what she actually accomplishes. End quote. For Marx, the American Civil War presented an opportunity for the self-clarification of the historical and political goals of an international independent working class movement. If 1848 had shown the end of the age of the revolutionary bourgeoisie, it had also raised the question of how the left could become a progressive historical force. In other words, what exactly were the historical tasks of the bourgeois revolutions? What were the tasks that they laid before them? And how could the left actually fulfill these? The left is constitutive of the problems with which it grapples with, and this was as true then in the 19th century as it is now. And if we consider Marxism as a self-consciousness of the historical possibilities of the bourgeois epoch, the American Civil War provided an opportunity to present the political necessity of a working class political organization. And I think that there is a deepening here of the notion of class struggle at work in, in Marx's writing, not as a defense of the interest of one class over the other. And it very much sort of you know, depends on what we mean by that, but rather as a confrontation between historical forces. And it was the force of historical regression, I would argue, that Marx and the First International self-consciously fought against in the interest of human freedom. I'm uh, Jeremy Cohen, a graduate student in sociology at NYU. Um, the title of this paper is shortened significantly. It's just called Lukash's Abyss. <laughs> um, in his idea for a universal history from a cosmopolitan point of view, Immanuel Kant sets forth to tell the story of humanity as if it were one of progress. This is not easy, says Kant, quote, since men in their endeavors behave on the whole not just instinctively like the brutes, nor yet like rational citizens of the world according to some agreed-on plan, no history of man conceived according to a plan seems to be possible. One cannot suppress a certain indignation when one sees men's actions on the great world stage and finds, beside the wisdom that appears here and there among individuals, everything in the large woven together from folly, childish vanity, even from childish malice and destructiveness. End quote. For Kant, rationality in human history depends on the future. By completing the seeds of freedom and development implicit in the present, we might illuminate and make meaningful the sound, theory, and idiocy thus far characteristic of world history. The stakes are high, again Kant, until this last step is taken, which is the halfway mark in the development of mankind, human nature must suffer the cruelest hardships under the guise of external well-being. And Rousseau was not far wrong in preferring the state of savages, so long, that is, as the last stage to which the human race must climb is not attained. End quote. Georg Lukács sought to revive a Marx that, like Kant, but under changed conditions, sought to, bring the, sought to bring the crisis character of the present to self-consciousness. This Marx understood the problem of his and our epoch as the unfinished bourgeois revolution, whose gains would be meaningful only from the standpoint of redemption, what Lukács calls the standpoint of the proletariat. The orthodox Marx Lukács found in the politics of the radicals of the Second International especially Rosa Luxemburg and Vladimir Lenin, stood on the edge of an historical abyss. This is very different, Lukács, than the Lukács who has gained some academic respectability of late. A sector of the academic left thinks that we ought to take up many of the analytical tools Lukács gives us in order to become more reflexive critics of capitalism, paying attention to the standpoint of our critique, to get past objective and subjective dichotomies that plague debate in social science, to talk about ideology as socially necessary illusion rather than mere will of the wisp. Sure, we have to ditch the politics, the crypto-messianic or proto-Stalinist, whichever you prefer, proletariat as the identical subject-object of history. But Lukács can help us become keener, more critical academics. I want to resist the assimilation of Lukács into the barbarism of academic reason. <laughs> As Lukács puts it in his What is Orthodox Marxism, material dialectic is a revolutionary dialectic. 
Lukash is not a mere analyst of reification on the model of his cultural studies epigonies. He sought to demonstrate that Marxism was, from beginning to end, only possible as a practical self-clarification of the ongoing crisis of society triggered by the unfinished bourgeois revolution. Recent attempts to rescue the academic Lukács are an an exercise in contradiction. It's precisely when he stopped being an academic that Lukács could move forward with his philosophical problems because they were being addressed politically by the revolutionary Marxism of his day. But just as futile might be the attempt to recover the political Lukács today. For Lukács' moment is not ours. The crisis and possibility of the early 20th century is far from what we face. So any recovery of Lukács must operate on two levels. One, by asking seriously whether we have confronted or overcome the crisis that Lukács attempted to formulate theoretically. And two, by recognizing that if we have not, we cannot simply take up where he left off. The problem of Lukács' reification essay is reason at odds with itself, reason that ends in mythology, suffering, and unfreedom. We return again to Kant, this time offering the battle cry of the Enlightenment. Ours is the genuine age of criticism to which everything must submit. Everything, not just ideas, but social institutions and forms of life, too, must justify themselves by appealing to reason, rather than through claims of tradition or dogma. The philosophical enlightenment and the political revolutions that fought under its banner, the American, the French, the Haitian, the revolutions of 1848, among others, looked forward to the realization of reason, freedom, and human self-development in this world, in our social institutions, and in ourselves. This would be emancipation, humanity's maturity, as Kant again put it. But bourgeois society, says Lukács, has been unable to fulfill its promise, We all too reasonable moderns seem consigned to contemplate a ready-made world. Lukács shows this reason at odds with itself, a more powerful and mythical dominating force than nature ever was, in play in all forms in our society, from the factory machine to the bureaucratic state, from jurisprudence to journalism. He peoples his essay with characters from the great social scientists of his day, Max Weber and Georg Zimmel, the bureaucrat, the abstract calculative individual, to describe a society whose reason is a soulless, restrictive rationalization, shaping humanity in its narrow image. He might, like Weber, have also turned to Nietzsche's last man, the shrunken, all-too-reasonable modern toady, happy, unable to give birth to a star. Nor does academia help us out of this crisis of modern reason. Disciplinary fragmentation is the rule, wherein the more we seem to know, the more reasonable each science becomes, the less it has to say about the nature of our society as a whole. Weber puts it like so in his Science as a Vocation. Natural science gives us an answer to the questions of what we wish to do to master life technically. It leaves quite a sight whether we should, whether we should and do wish to master life technically, and whether it ultimately makes sense to do so. End quote. We once thought we could go to reason with our deep questions. We now know better, says Weber. And importantly, for Lukács, Marxism has been on the whole no better. It has been only a more advanced form of this domination reconstituting reason. The target of most of history and class consciousness is, after all, Marxism itself, a vulgar Marxism that loses the capacity to affect the course of events. This Marxism had signed on to national war efforts in World War I, This Marxism was responsible for the tightening and spread of state control over everyday life. We will return to this point. Marxism for Lukács faced a crisis in which it would either have to transform itself or would become one more apologia for the status quo. This betrayal of emancipation by reason, this formalization, fragmentation, and tyrannous indifference to the particular is what Lukács calls reification. None of this, let me emphasize, can be solved by interdisciplinary programs. This is a problem, Lukács asserts, that arises in our textbooks because it is real. It has a basis in our form of life. Capitalist totality really does proceed fragmentarily, unconsciously, relegating humans into mere things. Reification is a Gegenstandlichkeitsform, a form of objectivity. It cannot be overcome except through consciousness, but it cannot be overcome through consciousness alone. We might read the entirety of the second part of the reification essay, The Antinomies of Bourgeois Thought, as demonstrating again and again that reification cannot become or be overcome in thought alone. But Lukács is not setting up philosophy for a fall. Instead, Lukács gives an account of idealist philosophy, struggling to express the problems and potentials of freedom in its moment. That philosophy's ambition and the limits which it reached are characteristic of the high moment of bourgeois politics, 
Bourgeois philosophy, says Lukács, is the self-consciousness of a contradictory age, whose further transformations and developments necessitated its self-overcoming. This attempt to realize a freedom not imposed upon, but imminent in, a transformed social reality is passed on to Marxism which itself, in turn, is undergoing its own deep split, its own crisis, taking up in transmuted form the earlier crisis of thought and action. Marxism, for Lukács, is the direct inheritor of a bourgeois practical philosophy of freedom. This definitively separates Marxism from many other varieties of anti-modern discontent, of which postmodernism is perhaps the most recent variety. Philosophy seeks to express, and through expression become midwife to the burst of, to the birth of, the freedom implicit in our social relations. And while this task is more opaque in Lukács' moment, Lukács refuses to sadly shrug his shoulders at the coming barbarism. He calls us to risk achieving the Enlightenment's promise. Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Schiller, and Hegel would not cede the attempt to combine reason, freedom, and human development, at least at their best, even as they conscientiously recognized that these could not be reconciled in a bourgeois world. These philosophers express that bourgeois society had not yet given up on itself. Bourgeois philosophy stuck with its ambition, to quote Lukács, the idea that the object can be known by us for the reason that, and to the degree in which, it has been created by ourselves. But through epistemology, morals, aesthetics, Kant's three critiques, and even Hegel's invocation of history, this philosophy, according to Lukács, kept finding itself left with, on the one hand, an incomplete formal reason, on the other, an inert and irrational object. On one side, a free self-determining subject, on the other, the brute facts and laws of the world. Reason simply reproduces a subject denuded of its capacity to shape the world and, uh, and itself, reconciled at the expense of unfreedom. Classical philosophy's honest folks focus on its limits was one of the things Lukács most admired about it. But even more importantly, that philosophical lineage attempted to probe and overcome its difficulties through developing a certain form of knowledge, the identical subject-object, its own age comprehended in thought, or practical self-consciousness. Classical idealist philosophy shows that freedom is possible only through a transformative self-consciousness, where knowing and practical transformation are mutually constitutive, where knowledge is imminent rather than abstract. Reason is not an abstract form to be imposed on a hostile reality, it is realizing something implicit in an object, an object which is actually already us. Something like in psychoanalysis, a neurotic a symptom appears to be a horrible, hostile entity to be conquered. We only can move past it if we recognize it as a development of ourselves to be understood and thus practically overcome. By knowing myself, I change myself. I am, but I'm not the same self as I was. Self-knowledge allows me, as Nietzsche puts it, to become myself. Marxism, for Lukács, is the attempt to realize the form of practical self-knowledge which offers the only hope of achieving freedom, reason, development. But Marxism has inherited not only the tasks, but the problems and crises of the practical philosophy of freedom. Neoconscient, scientistic Marxism, connected with varieties of reformism, becomes the farcical repetition of Kant's achievement. It fails to radicalize the Kant-Hegel-Marx lineage. Much like what Freud would call regression, the use of outdated psychic tools to cope with new problems and changed conditions. Marxism threatened to become stuck, failing to justify the leap the bourgeois revolutions had initiated. Marxism needed to learn to grow up, or more specifically, it needed to learn to stop thinking that it had already grown up. Lukács insists that revolutionary Marxism is able to concretely pose the problem of emancipation because its politics seeks to practically achieve the self-consciousness of capitalist society in its crisis. And capitalist society's crisis in its most acute form is the historical development and consciousness of the proletariat. As Lukács puts it, quote, the proletariat is nothing but the contradictions of history become conscious. But why? Firstly, because the rise of the proletariat meant historically the decline of bourgeois radicalism. The proletariat's incipient demand that they become the subjects promised by bourgeois society, free, creative, equal, led the bourgeoisie to become vulgar to give up on the radical implications of the Enlightenment and to call for law and order. Capital's tragedy is that it is already also the proletariat. The bourgeoisie's tragedy is that it must, by necessity, be one step behind capital. Secondly, because the proletariat is a commodity, and thus the ultimate object, 
She sells herself on the market, is enslaved by the machine, is thrown about by economic crises over which she has not a whit of control. For Lukash, quote, the worker can only become conscious of his existence in society when he becomes aware of himself as a commodity. Or, quote, the proletariat self-consciousness is the self-consciousness of the commodity. The commodity, this irrational reason, can itself make demands for emancipation because the typical commodity is the proletariat. We are used to thinking of the natural constituency of the left as those who are marginal to society. Lukash develops the daring claim of revolutionary Marxism that capitalism must overcome itself not through intervention of those outside, but by the action of those at its very center. The proletariat's fate is typical of the society as a whole, says Lukash, a reified creature through and through. Marxism is not the resistance to capitalism or reification or bourgeois subjectivity. It is their self-conscious realization and self-overcoming. Lukash saw in the crisis of Marxism precipitated by World War I, but already presaged in the revisionist debate, a reenactment at a new level of the crisis of bourgeois philosophy. Here, self-consciousness could advance the new tasks posed, or thinking would become little more than an apologia for domination. In the radicals of second international Marxism, especially Luxembourg and Lenin, Lukács saw the attempt to meet the tasks of the present, to formulate the politics that could realize bourgeois societies and Marxism's potential overcoming. The essence of Lenin and Luxembourg's Marxist politics was that socialism, in order to achieve emancipation, would have to be a conscious human act, imminent in present realities. It could not be deduced from social being, nor a fervent wish from the beyond. If one could stumble into socialism, if it was fated from time immemorial by inexorable laws, then it would be one more form of unfreedom, of fake subjectivity. Human consciousness would be an integral part of objective development, or nothing at all. The revolutionary Marxism of Luxembourg and Lenin, then, was for Lukács the attempt to realize the promises and possibilities of bourgeois society by consistently pressing forward the demand for subjectivity contained in the commodity itself, the proletariat. This politics, in extremely telescoped form, insists on the leading role of the proletariat as the most typical element and crisis point of capitalism, an emphasis on the subjective development of the proletariat and any struggles it undergoes, a fight against the reduction of Marxism into sectional interest, seeking its cut of the pie, the importance of emphasizing not victories, but limits in any given interest-pursued action by the proletariat, the concomitant value of self-criticism and self-transformation, the centrality of self-transformative political practice, and an organization or party dedicated, as Lukács quotes Marx in the Communist Manifesto, to clarifying the international and historical significance of a given action. This self-conscious capitalist politics elucidated for Lukács what the practical philosophy of freedom would have to look like in order to overcome the present and to realize the endangered, fragile past soon to become only the miserable precursor to an even more miserable sequel. Lukács' history and class consciousness might be summed up in Freud's description of the goal of psychoanalysis, wo es war, soll ich werden, where it was, I shall be. Self-consciousness changes us, but we are still somehow us. We have realized something about ourselves. Nor is self-consciousness merely in the brain. To be really self-conscious, we need to change our way of being. Lukács' Marxism is trying to recognize that Marxism poses the questions to bourgeois society and modernity as to whether or not it can achieve this kind of transformative self-consciousness. The prospects do not look bright. And why return to Lukács after all? especially if I insist that he was attempting to make sense of his practical moment, to raise the moment of world historical danger and possibility of roughly 1917 to 1923 to self-consciousness, what relevance does he have in a moment whose practical possibilities are so different, so diminished? Psychoanalysis, again, perhaps provides a useful metaphor. We do not revisit our childhoods to relive them, relive them, only to recognize how we have yet to integrate them by overcoming them. Lukács, again, helps us see that we haven't grown up. Which means that perhaps Lukács' identical subject-object seems so messianic to us, because we have surpassed, not because we have surpassed Lukács and his silly metaphysical speculations, but because we find ourselves no longer to imagine, this, no longer able to imagine this kind of freedom. We no longer believe that we can overcome capitalism for the better, realizing the reason, freedom, and human development it promises. Capitalism instead is a brute, inert, foreign entity dominating us in our capacities. All we can do is look to the marginal, the suffering, the pain, and offer sympathy and solidarity with their struggles. 
struggles that are part of the natural laws of history. There will be power, there will be resistance. Our politics takes something like the form of Nietzsche's eternal return. As critical as we are, we can only imagine freedom swooping in from beyond and bringing its liberation, its magical liberation, into our miserable lives. And perhaps we're right, for we are surely in the age of second childhood, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Was Lukash a fool for wagering on the possibility of freedom, i.e., by becoming politically a Marxist? Lukash would insist on Luxembourg's call, socialism or barbarism, either the imminent overcoming of capitalism and its irrational rationality, or resignation to ever new, ever horrifying forms of reasonable barbarism. I want to offer a quote from Rilke in the first of his Duino elegies, written in 1922, so right around when Lukash was writing the reification essay. Yes, the springtimes needed you. Often a star was waiting for you to notice it. A wave rolled toward you out of the distant past, or as you walked under an open window, a violin yielded itself to your hearing. All this was mission, but could you accomplish it? Without Lukash's Pascalian wager, not on God, but on freedom, it is not clear to me that Lukash is worth much of anything at all. The demon that drove him from philosophy to the politics of revolutionary Marxism is, if anything, what should call out to us today, not the analytical tools we can dig up from the grave of his practical philosophy of freedom. Or maybe he is just a dead dog. All right, we have about 15 minutes for questions. I have a question for Jeremy. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of your paper, you mentioned the usefulness of Lukacs in the social sciences. And I was wondering what you saw that we get from Lukacs that we don't get from other um, other thinkers, for example, Berger and Lachman, or Gramsci, or um, Rusnik and Wolf. Is that? That's yeah. pretty much um, the question. I mean, I guess for me, the big issue, I mean, it's exactly, I don't think we get very much of Lukács at all if he's assimilated to, well, he's just another, you know, in our handbag of social theorists that we can pull out for nice quotes at the beginning of an essay before we, like, start the real analysis, right? Um, like, I, then, you know, yeah, you might, you know, I mean, God, you could probably use Kesha just as well, frankly, as any of these people um, in order to express some of these things. It seems to me that what Lukács can do for us is to constantly sort of provoke the reminder that sort of Marxism as a social science itself is already a much degraded form of what Marxism used to mean. And that when Lukács was thinking about, say, understanding reification, overcoming reification, this was part of a, 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 you know, a telescopic political practice that tried to address the historical character of modernity, not a kind of a, a nook in the academic division of labor. Um, so it's to me, it's that it's that sort of call of Lukash to remember what Marxism was once about, and the sort of like the the small voice of the potential philosophy of freedom that maybe that memory still represents. That is how is is the only way in which I think it's worth having Lukash speak to us today. And could you speak more, like in terms of um, methodology for the social sciences that we get from from Lukacs? I, I mean, I guess it, it's it's a little hard for me to address the question because, in some ways, I think the whole, in some ways, the point of my presentation is he's not just a methodologist. Like, and insofar as social sciences thinks you could have a method that's subtracted from the nature of its object, insofar as it thinks you can have an analytical setup in, that accurately understands reality in a world where it's almost impossible to imagine the progressive transformation of that reality. I think those that impossibility, that holding intention, um, how impossible even the project of social sciences is in an unfree world, is what Lukács can offer us methodologically. That sort of Archimedean point of view of society. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for the whole panel, really. Uh, thank you very much for the panel. It was very interesting. Uh, I was thinking in terms of, I have to go to the name. In terms of what Jeremy said of the self-consciousness of the left, and since the first two papers addressed the questions of historical 
readings of Marxism. I was thinking if you could go back to that quote Spencer uh, used of the short-lived bourgeois revolution and think a little bit about that. Shall I begin? Oh, yeah, whatever you, you guys say. Um, I mean, in a sense, I, I would say that the panel is talking about, and even when Marx says bourgeois, pro, bourgeois revolution, proletarian revolution, the key word is revolution, that it's, the panel is about the, cap, the revolution of capitalism, right? That there isn't a different revolution with the coming of Marx, right? But rather, the bourgeois revolution, in its realization, is crisis, right? That the, the realization of the bourgeois revolution is crisis. That's what the French Revolution reveals, and that's why the left is born out of the French Revolution. Um, and for, which, which is why, for Marx, you know, the problem becomes the question of repetition. Right in the in 1848, right the the problem is not that the bourgeois revolutionaries you know donned the masks of Roman Republican senators. The problem is that in doing so, they brought into a world they they brought into being a crisis that could no longer be addressed in that way. Um, and and so the the issue of you know for for Marx is one of, you know, in that quote, is the way in which revolution generates a deepening problem of consciousness of the tasks of revolution. And that's why Marxism is a direct inheritance of the bourgeois revolution. Right? There's also a, a whole issue that emerges there of which is really at the heart of the Marxian project of the changing relation of theory and practice, which is, I think, really uh, what Lukács is beginning to get at in terms of this is, this is the difference between the kind of short-lived character and the way in which uh, ongo a, a proletarian revolution is constantly deepening its own problem to the point of revolutionary crisis, right, in that famous quote from the 18th Brumaire. I mean, I would just add that, you know, it seems to me the problem of slave labor and free labor that comes to the foreground in the American Civil War and how there is this sort of contradictory objective reality that's being reconstituted on, but that it's being reconstituted also on the basis of, you know, potentially being like liberatory, you know, it's an establishment of free labor and the kind of you know, bourgeois rights that are provided and gained in the bourgeois revolutions. And yet, that very same sort of concrete reality, that historical reality, this also seems to be furthering you know, sort of regressive tendencies, such as slave labor. And the relationship between the two, it's not that sort of slave, the slave economy exists outside of the reconstitution of the free labor relations, but rather that they're very much intimately bound up and that there is no guarantee that one would just sort of peter out, and that there seems to be an emphasis on the role of political ideology, um, you know, as represented by the American South, that has a role to play in the reconstitution of historical social relations that Marx, I think, is taking rather seriously. And that, you know, if Marxism is a kind of self-consciousness of this bourgeois epoch, of contradictions in the bourgeois epoch, then it has to be able to address such regressive political tendencies as the defense of slavery. And so in that sense, it's sort of bound up with possibilities of bourgeois revolutions. If I, if I could just tack on yeah. something to that. Um, I mean, I think one of the important things that Pam's paper is bringing out uh, is the fact that, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a simple point, um, but one that I think... Uh, people really don't think about enough, uh, which is that every revolutionary demand that's ever been raised or ever will be raised until the end of capitalism is a bourgeois demand. Um, the demand for free labor, the demand for the end of slavery, the demand for an eight-hour day, the demand for land, peace, and bread, 
these are bourgeois demands. These are demands within the horizon of bourgeois right. And that it, it, and that's in a sense, it, and, and the forms that are going to be used to pursue those demands, that are going to be used to pursue those the, the revolution, namely uh, the, the, the self-organization of the working class, parties, etc., are bourgeois forms. Political parties aren't created by the proletariat. The po political parties are a bourgeois form about which Marx and Engels had a great deal of reticence. Uh, there was a whole range of questions. I mean, you know, do we take up this form of advancing a particular interest in society, right, which is a bourgeois project. Um, and, and so, you know, the, I mean, you get people, you get Marxists puzzling over why does Marx support Lincoln? It's just, the, these are just bourgeois demands, right? And for Marx, there's a, there's a necessary connection between the emancipation of the through blood and iron of the slave system in the South and the raising of the demand for the eight-hour day in the first international. Right? It's an and and that's why for, for Marx in the working in the section on the working on the working day in the book Capital, which is written in the wake of the Civil War, though very few people understand this, America be, it begins it appears at first as a counterpart to the corvée system prevailing in Eastern Europe, and it ends as the vanguard of the first international raising the demand for the eight-hour day. Right, that famous quote about uh, white labor uh, and black labor uh, being, you know, that, that white labor can never be emancipated until, um, and, right, that, that quote appears at the end of the section on the working day. It's all about the, pro the proletariat's raising of bourgeois demands in constituting capitalism. <clears throat> yes. Uh, uh, let's keep taking questions, actually. I don't need that. Um, I, I had a, a, a question for Jeremy. Um, in, in, my own, in my own readings of uh, Lukács that I've done, I, I, I have um, seen that uh, there's very little innovation that uh, Lukács is trying to achieve over Marx. Uh, but in a sense, uh, but in a sense, Lukács sees himself not as improving over Ma Marx, but as um, continuing his work and, and, and kind of theorizing, in a Marxist sense, uh, uh, a new uh, phase of modernity. Um, but what I'm, uh, uh, what I want you to uh, maybe expand on. Is you know because uh, we, we we see Lukács as having like a very different focus. I mean, we imagine the world of Lukács as a world, as a world of, uh, uh, of uh, as a, as we have like a critique of bureaucracy and a critique of certain forms of rationality in a way that it doesn't seem to appear uh, uh, in Marx. So what I'd like to uh, for you to maybe expand upon is what has changed between the 1860s the era of, of Marx's capital and the nine, and the teens and the 20s the era of. Uh, what has changed historically? I mean, I think there are two sort of big things that Lukács is trying to come to terms with. One is how, and this is why he goes in some ways back to bourgeois philosophy as well, because his claim is that sort of political thinking writ large needs to deal with the kind of strange way in which time works in capitalism, that being something like the French phrase, la plus échange, la plus c'est la même chose, right? The more things change, the more things stay the same. That at the same time that there's a restless, restless dynamic, total, complete change of all conditions, at the same time, there's nothing at all seems to have changed. And it's this, it's this trying to deal with the, the contradictory character of dealing with new problems that ri arise that come from the historical transformations, but also at the same time the fact that the old problems sort of manifest themselves in those new problems. The old problems have not been successfully overcome. We still live in capitalism. And in some ways, that's the, a way of saying we live in capital. So that's one thing. The other thing I think that changed clearly for Lukács was the rise of Marxism, um, and that in some sense, the, the problems that Marx had to deal with, which was, I mean, in some ways they're dealing with similar problems. Marx is worried that 
working class consciousness would be insufficient in realizing the kind of radical potential that was opened up by the kind of politics that were going on in the 19th century, that consciousness was lagging behind rather than sort of realizing potentials implied in social reality. For Lukács, this is all the more the case that insofar as Marxism has gotten stronger and stronger, and insofar as Marxism has been implicit or complicit in the development of things like bureaucracy and things like soulless rationalization, um, you know, in, in capital, right, it's the, um, it's the, the change of the working day brought on by workers is what makes capital make the machine ever more like extractive of working people's power, right? Um, labor power. So it's that complicity that then requires a new stage of self-examination, of self-understanding of what Marxism might be, which is just, you know, I think it's, I think it's something, someone like Horkheim. It's basically like, it might just be history, you know, the kind of continuation of the historical dialectic of capital, which is probably history falling off a cliff eventually, um, or it might be the radicalization and overcoming of the sort of tendency of history. Yeah, I have a question that was kind of prompted by some of the prefixes that were being used. Um, in particular, Pam, when you described the uh, slaveholding uh, political oligarchy of the South as anti-bourgeois, um, and so I know that part of what you guys are, are uh, proposing is the left consider itself, the Marxian left in particular, consider itself imminent to bourgeois history, imminent to the bourgeois epoch of, of society. Um, but I'm kind of curious how you would articulate and expand upon your conception of the way that these discontents that would consider themselves to be, or we would consider to be anti-bourgeois, or Jeremy used the phrase, you know, postmodern, anti-modern, um, would themselves be uh, characterizable as imminent to the logic of bourgeois, bourgeois history, um, and, and how do we how do we kind of deal with these kind of uh, antinomies, both this drive of the Marxian project to realize imminent to capital the potentials of capital, and discontents, anti-modern, anti-modernities, anti-capitalist politics that are also imminent but see themselves as somehow like, outside of you know either in a progressive or in a kind of uh, uh, speculative, you know, future sense. I mean, just to clarify, because I think it's an important point um, that what the South has, in a sense, is a critique of capitalism. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a critique of capitalism that's based on an Cannibal idea soul. that re, a return, a re, yeah, a return to um, traditional society, a return to the morals within the family structure, a return to, you know, this is why they have this critique of the North as, like, um, profiteering and unpatriotic, this kind of thing. I think that um, what's, as far as, like, the way in which it's an expression also of, like, bourgeois sort of contradictions within a capitalist sort of epoch, I, you know, obviously the reproduction or the production of the slave South is based on its ability to be bound up with the objective reconstitution of capital relations internationally. So it's not outside of the logic that reconstitutes capital social relations. The ideology becomes a problem, I think, for Marx insofar as its response to these contradictions is regressive. It literally is a call to, as he calls it, it's a solution to capital, the, the problem of capital and, and, and property, or labor and property, in a way in which actually instead of pulling these, um, instead of providing the space for these to be articulated distinctly, it mm, collapses their distinction. And so hence, slavery is, you know, what slavery is, is, you know, uh, labor and property, right, as opposed to giving a chance of sort of a recognition, a kind of self-consciousness of what labor within capitalism means um, and how it, to a certain extent, could potentially sound, the, you know, it's undoing um, and, you know, in that, in that sense. But so I don't mean to imply, and I don't, you know, I hope that I didn't mean to imply it in, in the paper, that the South somehow, that its ideology is somehow outside of the, the contradictions, you know, within bourgeois social relations, but rather it is constituted on the basis that these contradictions are not overcome and so it has a particular response to them. Um, and so that's what I meant by anti-bourgeois. Well, you're making a face. So. I just, I feel like, <laughs> sorry. I mean, <laughs> so you have like some kind no, of I mean, I, think, I just feel like it's important to, to I mean, when you're describing as far as the reconstitutive logic of capital globally, 
um, as you know, the context in which the slave South exists, I think is, is critical to comprehending the character of the slave South and also the ideology. I mean, I guess I have a problem just thinking of them as straight up anti-bourgeois to the extent to which they completely adopt the American Constitution. You know, there is this understanding of themselves as well, being still. Well, they don't. I mean, I mean this, is, this is maybe too too technical or historical, but well, it's I just, not that technical. I mean, they don't. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I mean they they. One of yeah, I mean they rewrite the constitution. Not only that, I mean they find ways of interpreting founding documents that are supposed to present the you know the history of the American Revolution in a particular light. And I mean I think that this is why you know like when Du Bois says that you know what the history of the United States has been is sort of compromise, it's sort of cheap bargaining with human freedom. I think that. It is an interpretation of what the American Revolution is supposed to stand for that is also at stake during the American Civil War. I think that, you know, but anyway, so I would, you know, I would say that much. Yeah. I, I mean, I just want to address, and this is, you know, this word regression that has come up a few times. I mean, I, I talked in my paper briefly about sort of using it in the Freudian sense that it's not just like a return to the past, but it's actually the the sort of the the continual use of the same tools that barely dealt with past problems to deal with sort of new and transformed problems. And it seems to me that the in some ways what we might define as sort of like what it means what does it mean that it, one form is like outdated consciousness? It seems to me to be that it's in it it recognizes or it thinks of itself as adequate to its moment. It seems that Marxism's like best and only advantage is that it recognizes sort of the constant insufficiency of consciousness to its own moment and that it's constantly sort of this work of self-critique to overcome the sort of necessary misrecognition of present social reality. And that's something that all sorts of different forms of consciousness, whether they are academic forms of consciousness, postmodern or the slave South, the, the kind of self-satisfaction, the sense that we are adequate to a new reality, like we get it, um, that I think is the, that's what vulgar Marxism is, really. Like that's what vulgar yeah. thinking is, not like economism or whatever. Economism is just one form of vulgarity, which is the sense of adequation. Just to let, tack on to that, um, another way of, Another, another way of saying that is the greatest elute, in, in a sense, the most deeply reified illusion of, of Marxists is that they live in bourgeois society. Um, that, that, I mean, the real issue of reification and the potential for regression is a question of, as Jeremy says, is the, is the failure of Marxism to live up to the project that the working class is engaged in. Uh, the, the, the real issue of reification is, is Bernstein, is Kautsky, is the Marxism that's going to bury the revolution, right? That it's the bourgeois society that believes that it's just a question of, you know, well, we can, we can work this out in this stable democratic bourgeois system like they have in England, supposedly, right? The Bernsteinian illusion. Right? Rather than seeing that the problem of Bonapartism, the problem of vulgarity, which is objective, vulgarity is objective, bourgeois society is actively disintegrating as a result of the worker's struggle. The worker's struggle is constituting a statified world. It's a constituting a deeper problem for itself that it has to address. Its organizations are transforming society. It's behind, it's at the heart of world history, right? Which is why the issue becomes the self-criticism of Marxism, right? Lukács is really, the reason why Lukács is a problem to appropriate is that Lukács is the theoretical apprehension of the of, of, of the project of Lenin in Luxembourg, right? That the critique of reification is about Lenin in Luxembourg's struggle to render Marxism revolutionary, right? In a fundamental way. The reason why it's not akin to sort of modern day social science is because we don't have anything that's constituting capitalism at this level. I mean, in, a, in an important sense, we could say that Lukács' problem doesn't exist. Reification doesn't exist except in the most obscure, regressive form. For us to have reification, we'd have to have a left. Right, and that, I think that that's really at the heart of the issue. 
So uh, maybe you can act, ask uh, the flip side of this question from what I've seen. Um, how do you all weigh in on the, the violence and bloody legislation of primitive accumulation? Because uh, there's, a, there's a very troubling historical legacy of uh, challenging traditional societies through their dispossession uh, and, and the actual like institution of fighting traditionalism often leads to what I consider some of the worst legacies of uh, Marxism in practice. And it seems like uh, there's a lot of resonances with this sort of strategy within your approach. And I was wondering how you'd square with that. Tradition here, I mean, I guess I'm not, could you, what do you, what do you have in mind when you're thinking about, you know, the worst legacies? So often when uh, enlightenment reason is put forth as sort of the only advancement through a form of consciousness, then people who live on, on the commons are considered to be unable to be educated unless they're first dispossessed of their lands and uh, themselves make you know, bourgeois okay. before then they become proletarianized. And so the question is, sort of, uh, primitive accumulation was seen as a very negative thing in the end of Capital Volume 1, but then maybe it's necessary, like, break a few eggs to make an omelet, because uh, you need to get people to the to the point of reason. And if not, then how do you deal with people who already well, live in self I think that we should resist some system. kind of Stalinized idea of, like, a, you know, that the way in which primitive accumulation seems to refer to a historical process that brought about, you know, a free labor relations internationally. I think it doesn't refer to taking one particular, let's say, country like the United States, because there is this reading of sort of <coughs> Marx and, and the American Civil War as somehow, you know, Marx defending this process that's happening in the American Civil War because it's the first stage that then would lead to something that would be like a socialist revolution. I don't think that that's an accurate conception of what Marx is thinking about, which is why I think I wanted to emphasize um, the way that for Marx, the American Civil War helps him clarify the goals of an international left. Um, and so in that sense, I don't think that the support for the American war, uh, Civil War is somehow a support for a kind of stages conception of first we get rid of slavery, we have you know uh, free labor relations, and then we'll have socialism. Um, that, that's one thing. I, if I could, no, I actually, just, we have to end with Pam. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I just, you know, I, I do want to clarify that because recently, like, Robin Blackburn's book just came out on, on, on Marx and uh, Lincoln, kind of like has a way of resuscitating this, this theory. Um, and I thought, it, I thought it particularly problematic. I, I think that it, just to end, I think that reasons why we would return to Marx's writing on the American Civil War is to think about how in the post-1848 moment it was a way of conceiving of a kind of international goals for the left. That's all.